have a lot of people joining us today. Guys, let, let us know if you can hear and you can see us. Only because David and I have been experiencing a bit of technical issues. Well, mostly it's just me, so. Well, no, but hey I, I was yesterday, and I, I also was the was the responsible party for the technical issues the last time we did this. Oh, because okay. I, so I got ambitious. Go and yeah, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well, it's good to see everyone. Oh my gosh, and it's been a while. I'm so sorry. I've been gone for about an, a month and a half. So Nancy's here. Roland, hey, Roland, how do you do? Victoria, yes, she hasn't missed one yet. And Erica, hey, excellent. Good to see. I'm glad to see that everyone knows each other now. <laughs> Tracy, hey, and Gore and Dylan and Jim, thank you so much. Uh, David, how are you doing? Tucker is on. That's awesome to see you guys. So uh, we are going to be talking about the extreme weight and widths of type. <laughs> we'll be talking about actually a lot of stuff. And I'm really excited to, to bring on uh, David Jonathan Ross because um, I did not quite see all this talk with Tycon, and uh, I love what he's doing with it. Um, and then if you guys join me for my talk um, a couple weeks ago, will this be available to watch later? Yes, so right now it's being recorded. If there is no issues, uh, then it will record fine. If you uh, were here uh, listening to my talk with Jason Pamental, we did mention David Jonathan Ross quite a few times. Uh, as we were talking about variable fonts. So I think this is sort of like something that we're doing sort of on the back of it. I don't know, David, what you think about, I mean, we're gonna talk a little bit about variable fonts, correct? Yes, okay. It will come up. It will come up, okay, great. <laughs> so hopefully you guys can stay. And also I wanted to let you know that David has a program called Font of the Month Club and um, it comes in a three months and six months and a 12 months membership. Is that correct, David? Correct. Okay. And so what we're gonna do uh, for the best three questions, <laughs> David will choose. Oh, no, I don't want, <laughs> oh, no. don't make me choose. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, well maybe we'll do it randomly then. Um, <laughs> so so uh, yeah, if he does wanna be put on the spot. Uh, we will choose uh, three questions, three questions that you guys ask. Just use the ask a question tab underneath our video. And uh, we will give away three three month subscriptions or memberships to the Font of the Month Club. Um, I actually do have you want to talk a little bit about that? I have the blank membership cards for you right here. <laughs> Ready um, to go. Yeah, so just your name. Um, yeah, so I mean, wait, I'm, I'm supposed to talk about Font of the Month Club? Just a little bit. I know uh, it's not the topic, but. Yeah, uh, it's, uh, you know, I, you sign up, I send you a font at the beginning of every month. Um, kind of, it's, it's all right there in the name. Um, <laughs> I, this is, I, so I'm now on my 12th month. So it's been a full year of entries that I've done. And it's been just like super fun for me to kind of like step back from making big families and really investing a lot in in, in one specific family and, and rather just trying out a bunch of things that I wouldn't be able to try out otherwise. Um, and by things, I mean, you know, um, styles of design. I mean, I, I can I can essentially experiment with um, fonts that are maybe not as marketable or not as usable, but I love them and I want to see what happens with them. And yeah, so it, it's it's been, it's totally changed the way I've worked this past year. And so I'm excited to keep it going and see where it goes because, I'm not even ready for next month, so. <laughs> Ooh, so you're getting a real transparent uh, scene here. Uh, so David, is it mostly display or what type of uh, yeah, uh, it, fonts can we expect? It's most, so I, I, I claim on the website, I think, that it's display fonts mostly, um, experiments that I've been working on, and also in progress uh, beta versions of upcoming releases. So mm -hmm. for example, this month's is a super wide um, Latin, uh, you know, with the triangular pointy serifs, um, totally display font. Um, but last month's, well, well, it was also a display font, but it was a, a very more generic sans serif. It's a, a font output that I'm, I'm working on and I'm hoping to release later this year. Um, so yeah, I, I try to mix it up a bit, keep, keep it entertaining. And okay. also, you know, moderately usable. <laughs> 
that's that's important, of course. So hey, if you guys are interested, please uh, submit a question underneath the, the ask a question. Of course, you're going to have about 30 minutes to do so because uh, David's going to give us a little presentation talk about the extreme weight and widths. So uh, David, you want to get started? Oh gosh, okay. Um, okay, whenever you're ready. So sorry. meanwhile, I just want to tell you guys to please share out this event as we're getting started here. And also, if you see any questions uh, below that you feel uh, that you have shared questions, just feel free to vote them up. Okay, are we guys, are we ready to get started? Can everyone hear us okay? Let us know if, if we're ready to go. Um, everyone sees my pretty blue circle? Yeah, can everyone see the blue circle? This is the <laughs> indicator here. Yeah. See the blue um, circle? <laughs> does, it bother you, does it bother you that it's not centered? Because it really bothers me. Um, but but so so just so you know, um, I'm I'm actually I have this full screen on my screen, so I can't see if there's any chit chat in the dialogue. So feel free to trash talk me there. Um, <laughs> and also, Rachel, um, feel free to interrupt if there's any you know if there's any anything that I'm not doing right, or if you have a question or whatever. Oh, I, I guess questions you know they can type in at the end too. But you, you know what I mean. Um, yes. Okay. Okay. So. Um, this talk is about letters that get really bold and really dense. Um, so I'm coming at you from uh, Western Massachusetts. Um, uh, you can uh, this this is totally is not what the what, what the state of Massachusetts looks like. But if if it was, my town is a small town right about there. Um, but yeah, uh, I love um, you know letters that kind of you know just really go intensely in one direction. I mean, you can think of tight families of, as having axes, right? This is what we talked about with variable fonts, that you know, a, a, a single typeface can vary across weight and width and size and all these different axes. And when you really push them along an axis, interesting things start to happen. It's like, you know, if, if you like, you know, are going close, closer and closer to light speed, like the, uh, you know, like, like the laws of the universe like begin to fall apart a little bit. Um, and, and the same thing happens in letter drawing. Plus, you can uh, put cool, fancy images, like all the landmarks of Boston can fit in the word <laughs> Massachusetts. Um, so, so yeah. Um, so yeah, that, that's where I'm coming at you from. Um, yeah, so I mean, again, about, just about turning up those, those dials and, and just really seeing what happens. And sometimes the effects can be a little explosive. Um, but other times they can be really cool and really interesting and set your design work apart. Because um, most people, I mean, if you choose one of these typefaces, you're probably making a choice that most designers wouldn't make. And that's what, what, what makes it, what, what, I mean, like what, one thing that can make you different. Um, so yeah, um, you, I mean, like you might be, you might have been taught in design school if you went to design school. Um, you know, white space is very important, and this talk, in a way, is saying that you know, white space is kind of overrated in some design. Like sometimes it's just okay to just fill space with text, and that's like an okay way to design. Um, but actually, one of the coolest parts about these super dense, super um, you know, heavy or super narrow fonts is that um, the white space actually becomes super important because um, you know it, it, it because it's so small how it looks and where it's posi positioned in the letter um, is crucial to the communication of that letter and for for those of you who um, were with me uh, for my last dojo for you dojo aficionados out there I talked about reverse stress fonts and this is my reverse stress font called manicotti um, and uh, you, you um, maybe you remember that um, one of the things that really like taught me about type design, because this was my first typeface um, that, that I, at least the first one that I completed, um, is, is, you know, looking at this letter and not only seeing that it's an H, but looking in the middle and saying, oh, wait, that's a hamburger. And, and in case you don't see the hamburger, there it is. <laughs> um, and, and I share with I share this with the dojo audience not once but twice because this was super key for me in just like understanding what type design is all about. You know, it's about you know making those white shapes work with those black shapes because once we have that hamburger motif, then we look at the surrounding characters and we see that there are actually little hamburgers happening in all of them. Maybe they're slightly different, but even between the H and the E, you see like an unsliced hamburger, and then in the E, you see like a you know 
what three quarter sliced hamburger and 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 you know like you know essentially like the hamburgers are the thing are, are like, like like the glue that that ties this typeface together and makes it you know look unified like makes all these different letter forms you know speak the same language in a line of text um yeah so uh before I talk about typefaces, I do think it's worth saying that lettering has, you know, lettering is sometimes can be all about filling space. But lettering versus type, there are, you know, different variables, different factors involved. Um, and this goes way back. Um, you can even see in like, you know, old Hebrew texts that um, there's a tradition of extending letters at the end of the line. You can see one right there. In order to kind of, it's like a, a, like a justification method. You know, oh yeah, we, we, we want all the lines to look the same length, then we'll just make this last one a lot longer, and uh, it works. So it can be super basic like that, or super intricate, like um, the Kufic style of Arabic, um, where, you know, it, I mean, these are actually words that are, you know, fused together into these maze-like shapes that, that fill a certain space. Um, one of my favorite examples, this was shared with me by uh, Toshi Omagari, and this is a uh, Japanese banzuke, or it's a, a, I think it's a roster for a sumo wrestling competition. And as uh, Toshi told me, um, the, uh, I, I think the idea with this is the more dense the uh, document, the more crowded the uh, amphitheater will be where the competition takes place. So wow. I kind of like that. I kind of like that, um, <laughs> that tradition. Um, and then, uh, you know, more, more contemporary examples include um, Art Nouveau, where, um, you know, kind of letters, you know, are, are like kind of like a liquid that just kind of like expand and morph to fill a space. You know, so less focus on, you know, kind of traditional forms and more focus on overall composition and, and relating the letters to the space around them. And this, this whole idea was taken to a new level in the 60s and 70s with uh, you know psychedelic um, posters like this one's by Victor Moscoso another great practitioner was, was Wes Wilson and um, I am I, um, the, the letter form archive in San Francisco which is great if you uh, are ever in town there um, they uh, they have a great collection of these and they they did some really high-res scans so if you don't mind for a second we can just drool at these amazing letter forms morphing to, to fill that space and then one one more of that so yeah i mean this is this is what um lettering can do right because you know exactly what space you need to fill you know exactly what text is going to be written and you know like you know everything about the context type on the other hand you know very little about the context i mean like the whole thing at least i mean this is a bit of a generalization but one one of the things that makes type type is that you know everything kind of fits nicely into these little boxes and then we you know we, we kind of stack up those little boxes and that's how we can have a system that's modular and rearrangeable and all that fun junk that type is um but yeah for filling space though it can be tricky because you're really stuck with these little boxes um of course it's worth saying that any typeface could be used to fill space right um hopefully i don't know maybe you see that as being cringeworthy there's also kind of like a mini trend right now of like doing this quote unquote intentionally or ironically or i don't know um but yeah i mean so so you can take any typeface and squish it and squeeze it to fill space and i you know like maybe uh, i mean people are taught not to do this people do it anyway because it's really convenient um to fill space with type Meaning just um, stretching the type to fill the yeah, space. Yeah, yeah, stretching okay. type. And, and mm -hmm. I, mean, I have no fundamental objection to stretching type, but the issue is you need to watch what happens when you do it. Because what you can see here is that rather than being a sans, uh, like, like a neutral sans serif, this is Helvetica, where the fix and the thins are optically the same weight, when you stretch it, now all of a sudden those vertical fix um, become way narrower than the, than the horizontal thins, quote unquote thins. They're really thick here, um, and that's what gives you like that super distorted look. And that's and that's not you know good to do to your do, uh, it's not good to do to your typeface. Um, but yeah, typefaces that do this really well. Um, I mean, like I, I guess some designs are well suited to um, 
filling space and do a great job. And I'll just start with one of my favorites, which is uh, Mater Ombra, because I mean, they essentially, or they, Othmar Mater, um, essentially took a, um, you know, kind of carved these out of a square. I mean, you can see that capital E up top. It's like, mm -hmm. there is a square, and then we just carve that white space. It looks like a whale's tail white space right out of it. And then you see little whale's tails happening in the rest of the alphabet. And and it's just like a super cool, inventive design. You know, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's awesome. I, I'm probably going to say it's awesome a lot because I'm just showing you typefaces I like. <laughs> Um, so I, I apologize in advance for that. Um, this is kind of like a, you know, I, I like to show older stuff and I also like to show newer stuff that was maybe influenced by that older stuff. And so this is um, uh, Blenny by Spike Spondike. And um, you can see like those, those white shapes really kind of you know, cut into the letters and twirl around in interesting ways. And uh, one of my favorite parts of this typeface is, that it is the tie, which you can see on the bottom row. Um, where I, I just think that that whole texture is super um, unique and like I, I don't, yeah, it just has a really nice flavor to it. Um, uh, Stilla, in, in terms of script typefaces, or not script, but italic typefaces, is, is a, a, always a perennial favorite. And I was really excited to see since I gave this talk at TypeCon that. Um, James Edmondson did a Ono oh Blaze face, which I, I see as kind of a oh, spiritual wow. successor. Yeah, isn't this awesome? Beautiful. Um, yeah, and, and this is on uh, this is on the, on the new Future Fonts website where you can um, license fonts in progress, um, and, and it has a lot of great display designs. Um, th th this is not the only great one, but yeah, look at those figures. And, and just like, I mean, you can really see that as the letter gets bolder, those white shapes and how, you know, how they're blobby and weird and like th that becomes even more important than it would be in, in your standard text typeface. Um, going further from italics to scripts is, um, this is Sutura by Octavio Pardo. And now the, now the white shapes are so far kind of gone that they're actually being cutting into the next stroke. So, so you kind of have this optical illusion, right? Where, I mean, it, you couldn't do this with a brush um, or it wouldn't naturally happen with a brush, I, I should say. I guess you can do anything with a brush, but um, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, you, you can see that like, like these, these you, you can see the, see the strokes, like the strokes are, ex Sorry, I'm having a hard time putting this into words. You see what's <laughs> happening, but uh, but you know, like like the strokes are like go even further than they normally would into the into the following stroke, which is a pretty cool effect. Oh, and that cue is pretty bonkers it's as well. Beautiful. Mm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, again, white shapes, just like now they're just like these little slices. This is a climax by Andre Yelb. Um, and uh, <laughs> this is just one of my favorites, just because, I mean, do, do you see that fraction, the, the, the three quarters fraction on the, on the third line? Um, mm -hmm. Super funky stuff. And just like letting letters, you know, overlap other letters, letting accents overlap letters. Um, and you can see the small caps actually lose their counterforms altogether on the bottom line. The Panama, that's, that's how um, he differentiates caps and small caps. Um, Speaking of counter counterformless typefaces, this is Corpulent um, by Tomasz Brussel. And another another really nice, um, you know, where, whereas Climax is very hard edged, this is super soft. And mm -hmm. uh, an another very nice soft one is uh, Puff by Rob Keller. Um, a, lot, a lot of interesting stuff in this um, typeface. Oh yeah, that's Puff with three Fs. And um, yes, that is an FFF ligature. <laughs> That's awesome. And that that um, boxing glove that you see is actually the pointing fist Unicode character. <laughs> um, so so yeah. Um, and and I, I, what I appreciated about this typeface is that it didn't take itself too seriously. You can see the the subtitle for it is for fine typesetting. And um, Rob Keller really went all out on um, you know having a full set of open type features: um, superiors, inferiors, small caps, ligatures, case sensitive punctuation. The, I mean, the list goes on. Um, oh yeah, historical ligatures. Uh, wow. Oh sorry, his historical um, alternates like of the S. Um, yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I, but but and I think that's important because these typefaces I think can be great for in very specific situations. 
of course, they're probably not going to be your first choice for, you know, a, a branding identity unless you're opening like a, I don't know, a pie store or like a pillow store. I don't know, like what, what, what would be good for this? But like, I mean, it, like you don't naturally go, like I guess what I'm trying to say is these typefaces aren't the first ones that you would think of. But, there, but, but when you can find those opportunities, those like singular moments where a typeface like this works, it's almost tragic if you don't act on it. Um, and, and, and so that, that's why I'm happy that typefaces like this are, exist and that they can be as complete as they are. Um, so what's kind of interesting about, so I mean, I, I think this is maybe as far as we can go in terms of uh, things that are heavy in terms of weight, but there is this kind of um, moment where weight and width kind of collide, right? Where, where we have two axes doing two different things, but essentially they're, they're kind of two sides of the same coin. Um, and this is true in conventional typefaces. If you look at, um, uh, this is Title in Gothic by David Burlow. And if you look at the the eye on the and red on the far left, you can see as it gains weight, it also gains width, right? That's and, and just because naturally, in order to give it more weight, the letters have to be wider. And that's also true if you flip it around; it's a little bit more subtle. But as it gains width, it also gains weight. Hmm. Um, so you can see that. At, so so in order to you know because title in Gothic skyline is so dense it can actually afford to be lighter than titling Gothic extended. But the idea is to kind of give them the same overall impression of density, right? Because weight and width are just different ways of expressing density. Um, so, so yeah, and th this is especially true, I discovered in um, monospace typefaces, right? Where the width is totally controlled, right? I mean, the whole idea with the monospace font is that every single character is the same width. And that presents the typeface designer with um, some issues such as like if you take a kind of a more uh, like a simple letter like R and put it next to a more complex letter like M, because the M needs to get squished to put it to, to exist in that same space, um, it becomes more visually dense. And because it's more visually dense, an input and in a ton of other monosplace typefaces, you'll see this is also true. But in input, I actually made the stem weights different weights to kind of accommodate for that relative density. So if you look at the stem weight of the R and the stem weight of the M, uh, can you see those, those little circles are slightly different in size? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so as, I mean, this is subtle stuff, but the idea is, I mean, a lot of typeface design is making things different in order to make them feel the same. And this is a, 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 you know, a kind of a classic example of that, where you know, in order to make these letters feel the same weight, we had to make them different to accommodate their different densities. Um, and in the bold of input, um, this gets even more extreme because now we have that M is super distorted and squeezing. You even see it loses that middle serif because it just can't afford it. Um, and you can see that the, that the difference in stem weights is really punctuated um, as, as, the, as the bold gets heavier, or as, sorry, as the weight gets heavier. Wow. Um, so yeah, density is cool. Um, so um, I'll talk about a few fonts, a, a lot of a few fonts that are very dense. And I mean, so overall, in terms of typographic color, this isn't so different than Puff, which we saw a few slides ago, right? Because it's just cramming, is you know, just like filling that space. Um, but of course, the, the the difference here is that you are showing a lot more letters to do that. Um, so so yeah, this is Druck um, by Burton Hesby, and um, oh my gosh, I need to plug in. I don't plug in. Can, can you see my uh, my low battery thing coming up? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oops. I didn't think of that okay. one. That's <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> grabbing my cord. I don't know if you can also see my camera. See, there's always. I, I knew I was going to contribute some sort of technical. <laughs> it was just a matter That's of. That's great. Time. I love it. I love it. All right. Got the cord out of the backpack. Got the cord plugged in. I'm back. Awesome. All good, Exciting. David. All right. Um, so yeah, um, uh, I, I love Druck and, and Druck gets super wide as well, but I'm showing you the condensed weights because especially in the italics, like, look at that. That's ridiculous. Um, wow. It's just so nice. And, and, you know, one of the issues with a super dense typeface is what happens to letters like P and L and where, where, you know, it's part of reading the letter is letting in some white space. Like an L isn't an L talking about a capital L, if there isn't at least some white space on the, on the you know, top right of it. 
Um, and so trying to balance like the needs of each individual letter with the needs of the overall design, which is just to like fill stuff up, is, is a really cool task. Um, here's another example of super dense. Um, this is from Elmer Stefan. Um, and he did this thing last, oh, I guess now it's 2016. Um, so it's not last year, um, uh, called, called the Pite Foundry. Uh, hopefully people have heard of this. Um, it was, so, you know, I'm doing font of the month. He did a font every freaking week. What? Yeah. What? <laughs> yes. Um, so, I mean, so, and he did it for a year. And, and so th these are like, and th he had a really cool modular system that he used to produce them very quickly. Um, so yeah, definitely check out the Pipe Foundry because I think it's one of the more, in, and, and they're all very inventive and bonkers and weird and yeah. And so I really appreciated the, the font on the bottom where it gets very dense like that. And you can see how he cheated in the M and, and the, at the very end of the word by making those diagonals super thin in order to kind of give you that overall same texture. Um, this is another design that I, uh, I like a lot called Cinder Block by Stefan Kjartensen. And um, the idea with this is that some typefaces gain weight and some gain width, but this typeface gains height. So he designed a bunch of different styles um, that get very, you know, that have the same weight, but just get taller and taller and taller. And you can see that it, he kind of took it to a pretty uh, intense extreme. Um, wow. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll give you a second to read this one. Okay, what the, oh, let me ask the crowd. Guys, what does this say? Give us a second here. Uh, if Hopefully you can read this, what are the last ones? You, you are a, aha, uh -huh. Tracy, good job. Rachel, you are a freak. Wonderful. <laughs> yes. Um, so yeah, that, that's that's maybe like that, that would have been a good title for my talk as well, um, <laughs> <laughs> because yeah, no, where where we're going is not in the direction of readability. Um, but yeah, so so this is just a kind of a cool experiment. Um, another interesting uh, typeface that that deals with density in a um, inventive way is Cowhand by uh, Tashi Amagari, the, the 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 same guy who showed me the Banzuke uh, poster that I showed you at the beginning. And he's he's a designer at Monotype, and so he came up. They have these like sprint. Uh, oh my God, what is it called? Now I'm I'm blinking on the the program, but it's like they they complete a typeface in a very short amount of time. And so like, this is one of the, the typefaces that he did in one of these sprints. And, and the idea with it is that it has a bunch of different alternates in width, but rather than having them be separate styles, they're all crammed into the same font. So you get this cool effect when you type that as you type more <gasps> letters, there are features that make it reduce in width. Um, and so, awesome. so it's, it's, it's really cool to see how, how that typeface just is stretching and squeezing to fill space. Um, yeah, I, I love that O as it's super wide. Oh, and, and, and he even did like special exclamation marks that, uh, you know, get super narrow to help you cram in more space. Um, yeah. Um, okay, this is also a, a favorite of mine. Uh, Calcula by Shiva Nala Paramal. Uh, and this is a type of tech font. Um, and this was uh, inspired by the Kufic style of Arabic calligraphy that I showed you close, closer to the top. And one of the interesting things that he did is he um, worked with Tal Lemming to program a, a ton of ligatures. Um, so you can see as you type, um, the typeface will just, you know, let letters tuck into other letters. He kind of identified letters that could be in, you know, he called them intruders, and he let them intrude into the spaces of other letters. And this is cool because it starts to get out of that world of type where everything is in a box, right? And now we're dealing, this almost, this feels like it was lettered because it because it's so specific to those letter combinations. I mean, like this is not something that you can do with just a normal typeface. This is a lot of um, open type features and um, work and sweat that went into this. Um, and one of the other cool things that he realized is that, you know, these ligatures almost become patterns. So he, you know, like, so, so you can see like those circles are made out of the LLE ligature. And so mm -hmm. that's kind of like a cool secondary use for this typeface, not even to have it be readable, but just have it to have it, you know, look cool. 
So yeah, I guess this is where I should get into my own little take on um, you know, super dense typefaces, and that is uh, called fit. And as I mentioned before, you can add images and make things look super epic, and uh, I highly recommend it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so uh, the, the whole, I mean, like the concept with fit is fairly simple. Um, it's essentially just, can I make a typeface that just fills as much space as possible, no matter what is typed, no matter what the size is or what the space is. Um, and yeah, so you just give it text, give it space, and say, fill it. And so, you know, I'm going to get a little bit meta for a moment. Um, this presentation I did in widescreen mode, which um, is 16 by 9. But say I was to give this presentation on a 4 by 3 aspect ratio, I could theoretically have my typeface modify to fit that ratio without any reflow or anything like that, right? It's just using a different version of the typeface um, to fill whatever space is available. Um, so yeah, and, and this goes back to that whole stretching thing, right? Because if you take a typeface and you stretch it, you know, you can always draw a, a more appropriate condensed version, right? And so the idea with fit is that no matter what, how condensed it gets or how wide it gets, you're always getting that appropriate version. And this actually, oh, I, I, I need to say, um, <laughs> this whole thing, this whole typeface, this, this design started with an event that was organized by Rachel. What? And so it's a special, wait, you didn't know that? No. <laughs> I could have sworn I emailed you about this. No, wait, do you, okay, so um, I don't know if you remember this. This was like, 2000, yeah, 2014. And um, Michael Durrett, who's a, a, an awesome um, typeface designer and uh, graphic artist in, L in LA, was giving a talk. And um, there was like some something you did online, Rachel, where it was like, uh, you know, like submit an image that was like roughly inspired by Michael Durrett's work. Yes, we did a challenge. Yeah, it was a challenge, exactly. And, I, and this, is, this is what I submitted. And this is the first time that I ever did anything in this, in this area. And this is what became fit. Uh, of course, go. I should preface this by saying Michael Durrett's work doesn't really look like this. No, so, it doesn't. <laughs> In terms of you know fulfilling that spec, um, I probably didn't succeed very well. But hey, it it turned into kind of a cool font, and so I was I, I I did this, and I was like, oh well, what's kind of the coolest part about this is what happens like as it gets bolder and bolder, and so I just kind of took it to an extreme. Um, but yeah, it's, it's oh, and and the other thing I wanted to say about fit is that you can see how it deals with um, the box, you know, like that typographic box, very differently than Calculo, where Calculo is letting things intrude on other things. Fit is just about taking e each letter is just filling its own space as much as it reasonably can. So yeah, um, this this the, so the, the whole concept goes back to what I showed you with input, right? So you you have this stroke is or sorry this, this stem weight is slightly thicker than this stem weight, and then that as it gets bolder, those stem weights you know like that difference becomes more pronounced. So essentially, this just takes that whole idea to its logical extreme. So if I just kind of give you a space, like my screen, and we say, OK, let's fill it with the letter I, here's an I. And here's that <laughs> stem weight, right? And then let's say I'm actually filling that space with an R. Here's that stem weight, right? It's, a, it's you know, a little bit less than half, right? You know, it's half plus that little teeny tiny counterform. Um, so I mean, you know, it, it's essentially the same logic as a monospace typeface. Um, you know, as things get more dense, they need to get a little bit lighter to accommodate that. And then as it as you go, like say we go to an M, now we're dealing with about a third of the screen being, uh, you know, uh, you know, being a stem weight. And but fit is isn't a monospace, but but what it does is it takes that idea and pushes it beyond just the alphabet A to Z, but also allows you to essentially monospace entire words. So now you can see that now that's the stem weight, and I think you kind of get where this is going. But I'll take you there anyway, and yeah, so I I kind of pushed it in the direction of a cinder block, right where. It you know like the, as the stem weight gets um, smaller and smaller, the text becomes even more and more, or sorry even less readable, um, and yeah and and I mean it was kind of cool to like figure out where that extreme was where text becomes unreadable and then just kind of blow right by it, and then th this is actually the 
thinnest width, or, you know, and again, weight and width here are the same thing, right? Because um, as it gets narrower, it also gets, thin, um, you know, thinner. Mm. So there really is no difference in fit between weight and width. Um, but here you can see the counterforms are actually roughly the same thickness as the, um, as the, as the stems. And that's where I chose to stop. Um, but yeah, it's, so about the counterforms though, what kind of ties this whole thing together is that the counterforms are the same no matter what you type. So, you know, you can see like, you know, if you don't know whether to call it a font or a typeface, it doesn't matter because they both fill in the same space. Um, anywho, um, so yeah, I, I went, you know, not, you know, it's not only the letters that do this, of course, it's the numbers and the numbers are kind of nice. Cause you can see how I made stuff fit, which is by, you know, really exaggerating the waist of the letter forms. And by waist, I mean, like, are the pants pulled too high up or the pants pushed way down. And so you can see in most of these, um, I just, I just kind of chose one or the other, right? So in, you know, one, two, three, four, five everything's super low to the ground. And then six, in order to fill that space, I just push it way up. Um, and that's kind of how this typeface fills space when, whenever possible. Um, symbols, of course, get always get a little interesting. I'm still not sure about my solution for the percent sign, um, but I had no, like there, there really was no way to do diagonals in this typeface. So mm -hmm. it, got, it got a little tricky. Um, yeah, and then, uh, also, accented characters were a super awesome opportunity to make things fit in a new way because accented characters typically go above or below the line of type. But here, I tried to, to um, compact them by making them fit in, into that space. But of course, I did of course, um, include alternate accents that, that go above and below conventionally. And that gets even more extreme in Vietnamese where you have accents that get stacked on top of other accents. And um, yeah, so, so you get these letters that kind of just like dip down to accommodate for that. And, and this, I actually worked with uh, Donnie Trung, who uh, did um, uh, VietnameseTypography.com, which is a great website if you're ever typesetting in Vietnamese. Um, uh, but yeah, he, I, he consulted with me on this to make sure that everything was still, you know, I, I say readable. <laughs> readable is a relative term, but, uh, you know, I wanted to make, make it look as good as I could for Vietnamese uh, text. Oh, and also alternates for that. Um, then I was like, okay, well, this kind of has a cool constructivist vibe. So I was like, well, I, I should really see what the Cyrillic is like. So I drew a Cyrillic and I um, consulted with Masha Doriuli, who um, works at Contrast Foundry. And uh, she uh, helped me kind of make the right choices to keep this readable in the, in the same way. And uh, yeah, and I was like, well, Cyrillic, I should also do Greek. So here's fit in its Greek form. Uh, and then uh, the latest release of FIT, this happened just in January, was uh, FIT Hebrew. And this one I did not design myself. Um, it was designed by um, Oded Ezer, uh, who's an Israeli typeface designer. And so it was really cool to see, um, you know, how he kind of took, like, like the, the rules that I had set up and sometimes followed them, but also sometimes broke them. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if anyone in the audience reads Hebrew. But this is actually not Hebrew. This is a transliteration that says "fit is da shit." <laughs> so yeah, you're welcome for that. And I'm really excited actually about other language expansions. Um, did I see that Gore was around? Um, he and I are working on or thinking about something, and well, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. But, but yeah, hopefully this is going to be like the noto of unreadability in terms of <laughs> covering all scripts and being equally illegible in all of them. Um, so yeah, um, I released this about a, um, a year ago and as you can see, I think a lot of people liked it. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, this is actually one of the f favorite things I've ever had said about my work and I will probably show this is, yeah, this is amazing. Uh, cause actually this is the whole quote because, and, you know, in case you feel too bad about internet comments, um, he was like, oh yeah, kudos. It was actually pretty interesting. And I think what this poster saw in his own special way is that um, this, this design was not about being readable. It was actually not even about being a usable font. It was really about experimenting with this new format called, oops, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, not about being legible, but um, yeah, uh, it was about experimenting with variable fonts. 
And so now I'm going to kind of talk about the technical side of fit and how I was able to make that work. Um, so yeah, it just, uh, you know, Jason did a dojo about variable fonts. So I'll keep my, my summary of it super quick. But, but essentially, it, a variable font can be a more efficient way of expressing a typeface family. Um, so say you have your, your regular weight and say you have your bold weight, right? Um, conventionally, these are two separate fonts that contains two separate outlines, um, two separate kerning tables, two separate sets of metadata. And, you know, but they really share fundamentally, like fundamentally, they're the same design. So what a variable font allows you to do is to store one set of outlines, and then it just maps the differences from, from that one to all of the others. And then we can, we can then give, give those differences a name. Like those differences represent weight, for example. You know, it goes from light to bold. And, uh, you know, and then once we have that axis going, then we can say just with math, hey, give me a medium, right? And that's actually not storing any additional outlines. That's just calculating the, like what's, what's in the middle of the, you know, like, like, like the coordinates on the left and the coordinates on the right, finding what's in the middle. And if you can calculate a, a middle weight for free, you can also calculate any weight in between those extremes for free. And by for free, I mean without any extra data storage. Um, you still have to pay for fit. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so that, that is really cool because variable fonts give uh, users um, something that they really didn't have before. Yes, multiple master fonts, they did have this kind of thing, but um, the ability to um, choose very specifically um, attributes of the typeface like it, with very fine level of gradation, right? So not just choosing between regular and bold, but choosing anything, any point in between them. So yeah, the, the whole idea with fit is that you can get access to any of these A's and even A's that are in between the ones that I show you here. And all of that is happening from within a single font file. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's kind of like what makes variable fonts powerful. And that's why I wanted to experiment with these last year when um, variable fonts were you know, still new. I mean, they are still new now. Um, like we're still working on support for them. But yeah, so now in the latest version of Illustrator, this is fit Hebrew. And uh, yeah, so, so you can see how you can just access all those gradations um, via a slider. Um, and, and voila, you have an Insta, Insta poster. Yeah, that, that says poster in Hebrew, sorry. Uh, and, <laughs> and, um, and, and yeah, and then also on the web, you can do the same thing, right? There's this new um, uh, CSS property called font variation settings, where you can say, okay, give me an axis, like width, like, like that four letter code, WDTH means width, and then just give me a number, a numeric value on that axis. And that's as easy as it gets. And um, hopefully in the future, we'll see um, kind of support for higher level CSS. Like this is the native font width um, property. And so um, you can you know, specify width like that as well. Um, so yeah, if for Fit's website, I worked with Chris Lewis to develop some JavaScript to actually allow you to do the whole squishing thing that everyone says is a bad idea, but to do it without actually distorting the fonts. So you can see that as I squish these fonts, you can watch the counterforms. They don't actually get any thinner or thicker. They just stay the same. And that's because every single instance is an actual you know, type designer approved instance. There's no actual distortion happening to these letter forms. It's all stuff that was in the font. Um, yeah, so um, that was pretty cool. But the only issue is that um, support for that was um, Still, you know, it's still in progress now. I just took this screenshot today. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, we have, uh, you know, between one third and three quarters, um, you know, one third globally, three quarters in the, in the US support for uh, variable fonts. Um, when I released FIT, that number was zero because it was only uh, supported in um, experimental versions of browsers like, like the Safari, um, or sorry, Web WebKit Nightly. Um, so you can see like in the past year, um, support for this has exploded. And so we're waiting on Firefox, which does, which, which, which does have the technology, but they just haven't turned it on yet. And also Edge, and Edge, the Edge developers claim it's in development. So um, hopefully within the next year, 
we'll see even more progress. Um, in terms of apps, it's supported in um, Illustrator and Photoshop, but not yet InDesign. But again, you know, it's, I think it's just a matter of time. Um, so yeah, because support wasn't all the way there, we needed to figure out a fallback. So uh, I generated 1,000 static fonts. What? That, that would do the work of the variable font. Um, <laughs> essentially, I just kind of like wrote, wrote a Python script to do this and then just said bye, bye to my computer for over 24 hours. Um, I came back and then it had like, it, it had like reached its maximum level of memory. I forget what the particular error is. So I had to like restart my computer and then run it again. But I, I got all, all, all 1,000. Um, and then I was able to say, OK, use these static fonts if the browser doesn't support variable fonts. And, and the cool thing, one of the cool things about variable fonts is they save file size. And generally, you know, it really depends how much file size you'll save. But this is maybe the most extreme example of file size savings you will ever get with a variable font. So that's why I wanted to show it to you. So if I use those 1,000, actually, it was actually 1,001 because I did both instance zero and instance 1,000. Um, so that's about 20 megs of fonts. Maybe not so appropriate for your website, right? But the variable font, um, I, so again, I can't see your screen, but it, does anyone want to guess? I don't how know large the I, variable font would how be? Large, how large the variable font would be to, to express okay. the, same, the same design range with the same granularity as these 1,000 fonts. Okay, so let's get some guesses here. Edward says 48K. Donnie says 100 KB. Jim Kidwell says two megabytes. What else do you guys think? So down from 20 megabytes, what do you think? Okay, um, okay. Uh, is, that, is that good? 56 KB, okay. let's hear Well, it. Um, the person who gets 48 was the closest. Wow. And I was, uh, yeah. So, I mean, again, this is so extreme. You will never see this in using practical fonts. But the nice thing about using extreme fonts is you get extreme savings. And I was like, damn, this is pretty cool that I can have that level of granularity. And it took so many fonts to get the same effect, you know, like so many conventional fonts. Um, so, yeah, um, again, don't expect this from all variable fonts. This is just for fun. Uh, I have to disclaim that because, yeah, you, you won't get those results again. Um, but kind of the cool thing about working on a useless font, and, you know, I, okay, fit, again, is not useless, but it's just searching for those very specific times where it's useful, right? But, <laughs> it's a good way to put it. <laughs> right? Um, I mean, like, let's be real about this typeface, right? Um, but, but the cool thing about working on it is that those same things that you, that you kind of think about in extremes can be really practical if you kind of just like pull them back a little bit. So this is my typeface um, Gimlet. And one of the things with Gimlet is that it has different widths for text. So with the idea that you could actually um, substitute out um, different widths as, as the over-responsive website changes in width. So you know, if, if, if your web design is adapting to the width of the device, why, why would the letters of the typeface not follow that? So I don't know, can you see? It might be a little pixely for you, but um, on the phone, it's actually using a narrower width of the typeface. So you can squeeze another word or two per line. Um, so yeah, and then uh, you can also say, like, you can also think about variable fonts having width play, like just to, you know, OK, we'll take a Three line type, uh, three line headline, and make it two two lines, That's or right. um, you know even uh, I I um I've been really thinking a lot. You know, justification is kind of a pain in the butt, right? But if you had a variable font that could do very subtle um, variations in width, you could you could theoretically justify a typeface or sorry justify a paragraph without hyphens, right? If you were subtle enough, you could make you could fill in those gappy space spaces with just a slightly wider version of the font. And of course, OK, I'm doing this here manually. But I was like, well, if I can do this manually, then a computer could probably do it algorithmically. Mm. Um, and what was very excited is I, I um, showed this to some people at Adobe. And they're like, oh, cool. And so uh, actually, uh, Bram Stein, who uh, works at Typekit, um, came up with an algorithm that actually did this. So let me show you just this is so this is from a presentation that he gave. Um, again, all this work is happening like on variable fonts is happening right now. He gave, he showed this off for the first time uh, less than a month ago. 
Um, so uh, yeah, so, so this paragraph, th this is showing kind of a, a conventional uh, justification algorithm. And you can see the, like the little bars on the right show how much space is being added or subtracted in order to make it justify. And so if you use um, a variable font, um, you can see how that, that change in space is almost eliminated. Um, so I'm gonna, th this is like classic type design back and forth of like nothing actually changes, but yet so much changes. Um, so I'm gonna go back and forth. Um, can you see how the variable font, like if you watch that first line, you can see that like, the, like the space characters in the first and second lines are a little gappy. Um, and then in the variable font version, you can see how that gappiness is really smoothed out pretty nicely. And this is even more extreme, like the effect of this on a shorter measure. So like on a phone, um, you can see how much, how many gaps need to um, be added and subtracted, um, subtracted in order to uh, make this paragraph justify. But with a variable font, you can see that it, uh, you know, again, it's so subtle, um, but you get a, a much nicer color in your paragraph. Um, so yeah, it was really cool to, to see Brahm take like this, like, you know, dumb screencast that I did of me manually tweaking, you know, lines and mm -hmm. make it into an actual algorithm that hopefully we could have in our app someday or in a browser someday. That's great. Uh, so yeah, so um, in uselessness, there is usefulness. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, just, uh, you know, I, I can, I don't actually, I, have, I haven't, I don't even know how long I've been talking. I think it's probably been too long. So let me wrap this up real quick. Um, this is a tweet by the publisher of Calcula, um, you know, where he noticed that most of the people ordering his font were other typeface designers. And, you know, mm -hmm. and other people have floated this, this concept of a type designer's type design. Like people, sh you know, like you're, you make a font not to actually have people use the font, but to sh almost show off to other type designers. And I don't really love the idea of this, right? Because I mean, I don't, I've never made a font to show off to other type designers. I'm always hoping for people to use it. But again, I, mean, I, I, I do realize that some typefaces are more natural to general, or more naturally suited to general use than others. Um, and I think it comes from this idea of like a typeface, like is a typeface a tool, right? And, and a tool, you know, kind of solves a problem. It, it fulfills a task. It kind of makes the, the, the user's life of the tool easier. And um, there's been a lot of talk about on Twitter about this recently, so you can find that if you want. Um, but my, my take on it is that typefaces aren't as much a tool and are more kind of like an instrument, right? Where, you know, the idea, you know, it's not good to be challenged by a tool, but it is good to be challenged by an instrument. And I think if you're doing display typography right, you're letting your typeface challenge you a little bit. You're not just choosing the thing that'll make it the easy, like just really set really easy, set super nice, you know? I mean, you can kind of take Gotham and put it in anything and it'll just look nice, right? Fit, obviously you can't do that. Um, but it's about, you know, I think type, good type selection is about making specific decisions when you can. And not every, so I mean, I'm not saying that every design should be fit, right? I mean, obviously it can't be, but, it, but I like the idea that like you can, you can take, you know, I mean, I, I guess you can take a, a, a poster and add a typeface and boom, it's instant graphic design. Um, this is another example. This is one of my favorite examples of fit and use. This is a, um, a book that is, that is designed to take stealth photos. So you stick your phone inside the book and then you can look like you're reading and uh, take pictures of people. <laughs> Nice. Um, but, but yeah, super appropriate for like a wacky font design. Um, so yeah, I'm uh, anyway, sorry. Um, but yeah, so, so there, there's this idea that like, ex even if you don't end up at an extreme, the extreme is always worth exploring. Um, I was taught this, um, in typeface design. So like, you know, if I'm trying to draw a bold, I'll actually draw a black and then dial it back until I get the bold I want. Right. Because you never, if you, if you don't go very far, you never know what it's like to go further, where, where if you go too far, then it's always pretty easy to dial things back. And I think that's a great, um, you know, a great thing to consider as you're choosing typefaces, and as, as you're using typefaces. It's like, try the weird thing first, and then if it's too weird, just dial it back a little bit. It's not that hard to do. Um, 
so yeah, and, and so like this, the whole idea with Fawn of the Month Club is kind of taking those things that are maybe a little too extreme or a little too weird and just kind of rolling with them. And so like you can see this is my, uh, what I've done so far for, for that. Um, so yeah, and, and then I think that endeavors like Future Fonts and uh, the Pipe Foundry, which I showed you examples of earlier, um, also do great, great work of just like, you know, letting extremes be extremes and hoping that designers will find the, like those specific moments to make those work. Um, so yeah, again, it's worth trying no matter what happens. Um, fortune favors the bold. Uh, thanks so much. That's great. Lovely, thank you. Oh my gosh, that was great. Cool, am I, am I back? Can you, you see You are that? back, yeah. Cool. Very um, nice, thank you. It was really well written. It was really well done. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, so what I love what you said about being, a, you know, a typeface or a font uh, is an instrument. Not only is it challenging the designer, but it seems to also challenge the reader in terms of at least fit and some of the other examples that he had shown. Yes. <laughs> so love that part. Hey, David, we just lost you. I don't know. Or can oh, you really? still hear us? I, yeah. I can oh. still hear you. Yeah, okay, hi. there you go. You came, you came back. All right, so thanks, guys. Uh, what we're going to do is just answer a couple questions. I hope it's okay. We're going to go over time, if that's okay with you. Yeah, David? my bad. So, my, sorry, everyone. That's okay. It was very interesting. I found it um, uh, just amazing to see some of the some of the work that type designers are doing now, utilizing the new technology. Um, and, and what is that? Calcula is that's an amazing tech base. Like, wow, I can't imagine working with that, but I would love to to play with it. So, all right, so let's start here. I'm going to answer some questions, guys. So we're going to answer, uh, or I'm going to ask you Nancy's question. After doing this for a year, what's the best thing in terms of learning that you can take away from the experience? Is there a certain buyer behavior that is evident from doing this program? Nancy, are you talking about the font of the month club? I think she's talking about font of the month club. Um, I, I, I think, did, is Nancy the person who said she had to leave? Um, yes, yeah. 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 So, um, so hopefully she'll see this later. But um, what have I learned about buyer behavior from font of the month club? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's kind of a, it's an, in, I, I think that there is a, a, a type of person that is willing to license a typeface without knowing what they will use it for, right? I mean, because when, when you sign up for Font of the Month Club, you don't know what you're getting. I mean, you you know the the, the current the current month's font, but I mean, I don't. If if you ask me what will be next month, I mean, a I'm not even sure because I don't know what I can finish. Um, but b even if I was sure, I wouldn't tell you because that's like part of the part of the game. Um, so yeah, I think the idea is that like you know a certain designer uses fonts enough and wants wants to be exposed to interesting fonts cuz like this is the idea is once you once you subscribe to the club then those fonts are just on your computer you don't have to go out and find them they've already found you um and so i, I don't think that it makes you know i don't think that it you know if you're a designer that just licenses fonts for a specific project it this isn't very helpful to you um, but if, if you're someone who kind of like wants to have their hor horizons broadened and wants to be exposed to, you know, kind of unusual or interesting work. Um, and, and I mean, it, it, you know, it kind of like, you know, as that thing, like the whole thing is like, if you see a typeface as an instrument and you want to be challenged by it, then, then I, I think that that is kind of, yeah. I, and so, yes, I, I, what I found is that there are people like that. Cause I thought it was going to be like my mom and two of my friends signing up. <laughs> and my mom actually did sign up. So. Oh, that's nice. Does she use your fonts? Um, she has. Oh, good. I get, I get things about like, oh, she's like, oh, is this supposed to work this way in Microsoft Word? And I was like, I don't know. I didn't test it there. <laughs> that's <laughs> awesome. Um, oh, I love it. Yeah. I love it. Thank you, Nancy, for asking the question. Okay, so Jim Kidwell is asking, what do you think of house industries and Beg Ed Pengat interlock? And their yeah. use of massive number of what I believe are contextual alternates. To me, it has a it has that 50s, 60s throwback to the surf culture aesthetic. Also, how do you see these new variations fitting into modern design culture? Um, so edit interlock is a great typeface. Um, mm -hmm. Probably wouldn't have been very appropriate for this talk. So 
Um, and actually the, the person who I'm, if I'm not mistaken, the person who did the open type programming to make all those ligatures and contextual alternates work, to, work together was Tao Lemming, who is the same person who worked with Shiva on the calcula typeface. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there, there's, I think there's a lot of overlap both in concept, but also in actual personnel between those two typefaces. Um, so, uh, I, and I mean, you should check my accuracy on that. Um, but yeah, and, and interlock is great. I mean. I mean, what's not to like about it? It's so, um, and, and sorry, the, the, the second part of the question was how do I see these variations? Fitting into modern design culture. So, I mean, I think that they're gonna do, I think there are kind of two sides to variable fonts. Um, one is the everything gets tweakable, like everything is tweakable side. Like, you know, you know like those little things, just like making justification that much easier to do without, you know, without resorting to giant spaces or squishing type. Um, I just think that's like a, like a nice takeaway that like, hopefully users won't even have to think about that. It'll just happen for them. And that's kaboom, that's great. The other end of vari variable fonts is I think they're gonna kind of introduce a new wave of experimentation and just like people playing with, you know, fonts or software. So it's just like people playing with the software to kind of see what happens. Um, and there, there are some already some, some nice collections of variable fonts out there. Um, I think Jason Pomental mentioned a couple of these. Um, uh, uh, Axis Praxis, so that's axis-praxis.org. Mm -hmm. um, and also vfonts, v-fonts.com. Here, I should just type this in, axis-praxis.org and v-fonts.com. Um, and, and what I'll do is I'll also just send a, a, a recap afterwards and we'll include the um, the interlock as well, so everyone can see what we're talking about. Cool, because um, yeah, and, and then that'll give you an idea is that, that there's kind of experimentation already happening and hopefully, yes, that experimentation maybe begins with type designers because obviously we're the ones who are maybe affected by variable fonts the most, but I mean, if it ends with type designers, that would be really sad. And so that's why I love talking to um, other types of designers and kind of sharing uh, sharing with them what I do and what I think is cool because Hopefully they'll pick up a little bit of that and try this stuff out themselves. Jim, I hope that I answered your question. Yes. Uh, can you see what he's saying? Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Very cool. You know, I have to say um, just really quickly about the um, about the doing justified text. I mean, if you already know how to use InDesign really well, you can do a little bit of scaling of the glyphs in order yeah. to fit. But what you're saying with variable fonts is that we can set it up so it scales automatically. It would it would scale them, but without distorting them, right? Because because when you do that scaling, right, mm -hmm. you're actually changing the stem weight. Because as you make a font narrower, you also make the stem the, like like the vertical stem thinner. Mm -hmm. And if you're, if you're super subtle about it, right? If you in in InDesign, I mean, like you can get away with like ninety eight percent to one hundred and two percent, and like probably people aren't going to notice. Right. But with a variable font, you're actually doing, you know, you're not mechanically scaling, you're scaling along my axis that I've drawn for you. And theoretically, you're going to get nicer results because you're not going to get that unintentional variation in stem weight that comes from a distorting a typeface. And is that a default that's built into all variable font designs that it's just not going to skew or... I mean, uh, are you are you planning out the the design every step of the way? Is it like kind of like a breakpoint in responsive design? Yeah. So I mean, like the way that the like the variable font works is that there's like kind of a single default font, right? Mm -hmm. And then there are variations that kind of radiate from that default. So um, and then those those the the directions that they vary that they radiate is along an axis. Sorry, I'm using words that are way too big for me. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, you know, along the width axis, I would draw that, that default. And then I would draw the widest I want to go. And I would draw the narrowest I want to go. And I can also draw other things in between there if the design needs tweaking at any moments. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, then, and then you can travel along that and stay within the things that I've drawn, but getting new results to what you need. I mean, it's kind of like, I mean, I think um, variable fonts are cool because they kind of like break down that wall, I, I hope, between type designer and type user. 
because now you have access to stuff that previously I only had access to, like choosing the specific weight or the specific proportion. Or I mean, because you, you can have axes, you know, you can have an ascender axis. One of my fonts of the month has an as ascender axis where the ascenders just go, whoa, whoa, you know, like that. And, you know, so, so it, it gives uh, uh, users more choice, but at the same time, it gives me the opportunity to, blah, the opportunity to communicate my preferences to you. Because I can say, oh yeah, at optical size 72, at 72 points, this mm -hmm. font should look like that. You know, so I mean, it, it you know, because I mean, I, I, I say this stuff in my, my PDFs, my specimens, but you know, how many times are you actually consulting the, the specimen when you're using the font? Okay. Probably not very often. <laughs> Uh, not me. I don't necessarily look at them. Okay. Yeah. I mean, of course, you know, like I would love for everyone to read every, every word that I write about my typeface. <laughs> like I know it's not going to happen. And so variable fonts give me a, 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 just like a line of communication between designer and user, right. which I think will help. Okay. So we'll do Edward's question. What tools and software do you use to make a font? So I use a uh, robo font. Um, which is a uh, UFO editor. U UFO is a file format, um, unified font object. Yes, there are a lot of puns dealing with the other kind <laughs> of UFO. Um, uh, and then um, I also use uh, other editors um, such as uh, um, Metrics Machine for kerning and uh, Superpolator for interpolation. And um, so I, I have a pretty s specific workflow. Um, for people just starting out, um, I mean, I think Robofont has uh, educational licenses for classes. So if you're an educator, you can get a, a, an educational license. But there are also, um, uh, there's software like Glyphs. And Glyphs has a mini version, which you can get. It's like the Photoshop elements of, of you know, it's just like, like a basic character set. Or sorry, a basic feature set. Oh my god, I just said character set. I love it. <laughs> I, 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 I draw too many fonts, people. <laughs> I need to stop. Um, yeah. and and. Um, yeah. So 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 yeah. Robofont, Glyphs, and Font Lab are, are I think I think the big three ones that people work on. And for me, it's Robofont. Okay, great. Did that answer your question, Edward? All right. Tracy's asking, who does all the maths? It's hurting my brain. The maths. <laughs> I, I hope the computer does most of the maths. If I <laughs> if I um if I if I you know I'm not great at math. I, I mean, I actually spend too much time on like, you know, middle school and high school tutorial websites. Cause like, if you have, for example, if you have like your upright, um, your, your, your upright font and you have your italic font at a slant, um, then all of a sudden you realize that you're dealing with a right triangle, which means that in order to calculate like, like how much the, the italic leans over, you need to use trigonometry. And I mean, I did trig in like late middle school, early high school, but it's like, I don't remember that. So yeah, I'm going on and I'm like, you know, finding all these like websites for like Miss Peterson's seventh grade class and figuring out and teaching myself how to do this nonsense. Really? Um, but, yeah, but, but I mean, what, what I try to do is I try to encode that knowledge in a script. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of what I'm, you know, some of what I'm doing, I'm actually writing in code in Python and then I'm running that on my website or on my fonts. Does that, was that what the question was about? Uh, JC, if you're around, I, I think that's, I think, I think so. Okay. <laughs> really tell. There's a lot of math, so. Yes, she says it still hurts her brain. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Welcome to the party. Okay, so we're going to do like three more questions, four more questions. Uh, we'll try to wrap this up in five minutes, guys, just to let you know. Okay, so Manik is asking, uh, any suggestion of tool software for creating fonts, especially for students? I think you mentioned this a little bit earlier. Yeah, so I mean, uh, if, if if you're in a class, and double check this, um, I mean, I love Robofont. Um, Robofont is limited in what it can do. It's just like like the idea with Robofont, it's like it's it's very bare bones and then you kind of extend it. So like some of my Python scripts, like my, italiz my italicization script, um, I it just like extends Robofont's use. Um, a, a one that's, you know, Glyphs is a bit more fully featured, but you're kind of more invested in their workflow. Um, so yeah, I would, I would check into those two. That's my personal opinion. Okay, Manic, I hope that helps. I don't know if you've already left the room. 
Uh, Donnie is asking, oh, here he is. He's still here. Hey, Manic. So Donnie is asking, do you prefer design a display face over a text face or vice versa? Hmm. Um, <laughs> there, there's such different kinds of t design. Right. Um, that I, I like a mix. Um, and yeah, I've definitely like this past year, I've been on, on a display kick because totally. <laughs> fun of the month club, but, but even fun of the month club in November, I released a text face for it Just and beautiful. I, I, oh, thank you. Uh, and I have another text face beta font that I, that I'm planning for a future month, um, as well. So, I mean, I, I guess I like the mix and that seems like a real cop out answer, but it's like, I, I don't know. I'm. You know, I think that there's value in both kind of restraining yourself and in letting yourself go. That goes for everything. Yeah, I guess, yeah. <laughs> Generic wisdom from DJR. Exactly. Okay, so one more from Erica. And there's the Erica. Uh, what do you draw your inspiration from? How do you get your creative juices flowing? Hmm. Um... I mean, this past year, it's just been to like force myself to draw and force myself to finish things. I mean, I think, again, I, I'm not trying to push Fun of the Month Club too much, but it's just like, because it's changed how I work so much, the pressure of actually having to deliver something every month has just forced me to find things. And I mean, I almost feel like I'm a student again, like every... Um, like everywhere I look, it's like, oh, could that be a fun of the month? Oh, could that be a fun of the month? You know, looking at, and I, I love taking pictures of signs. My wife hates when I, when we travel together and like, I'm, you know, going super slow and having to like cross the street or like trespass on people's property to take pictures of signs. Um, I don't know. Um, and also I think that I, you know, as I hopefully showed today, technology itself can be an inspiration. I mean, I wouldn't, I would have have let fit stay, um, you know, just that piece of lettering I did for Rachel's event until it was actually the, the whole idea of variable fonts is like, oh yeah, I should, I should try that out because, because the technology just had just become available. Um, so, so, I mean, I think that, you know, for me, uh, just like figuring out, like tinkering with, with software is a, is a nerdy way to get inspired. That's good. That's a good answer. I love yeah. that. <laughs> Thank you, Erica, for asking. Thank you, everyone, for asking the question. So I'm going to ask David, can you just pick uh, three numbers out of one to seven? How's that? Okay. okay. Um, two, four, and six. Two, like even. four, and six. Yeah, even numbers, even handedness. So we're going for the Font of the Month Club membership. One is to Jim. One is to Tracy, and then one is to Donnie. Congratulations, guys. <laughs> oh. oh, 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 actually, pick one more. Pick one more. Pick one more? Uh, Donnie is uh, actually already a member. Oh, OK. All right. <laughs> so we'll do the one after that. It would be Erica. Awesome. OK, cool. <laughs> Awesome. So Jim, Tracy, and Erica, we will contact you and uh, get you information for a membership. What? Yeah? Oh no. Yeah. I was just I was just making sure, yes. <laughs> okay, excellent. Well, thank you again, David, so much for sharing this. This was great and very, very enlightening. I never thought I'd be so uh, excited about variable fonts as I have been for the last couple talks. Um, at first when it for the technology first came out, I'm like, oh, okay, so you can you know, play the wits or whatnot, but now, my gosh, what you guys are doing design-wise with this technology is outstanding. So very nice to you. I look forward to more work that you're doing. Um, hopefully all of you guys will watch uh, David as well. David, what's the, best, what's the best way to watch what you're doing outside of Font of the Month Club? Yeah, that's a, I mean, yeah, I, I guess just my website. Okay. Or, I mean, you can follow me on social media or whatever if you want. And I'm, <laughs> I'm moderately okay at posting to that. Um, okay. I'm, everything is just DJRRB. That's uh, my initials and root beer. And root beer. Is that what RB stands for? Yeah. It's my, oh, that's, that, that, that's, that. my, that's my AOL instant message screen name from middle school. 
Oh my God, that is super cute. Yeah. Your, your website is djr.com or rb as well? No, okay. no rb. No, <laughs> no root beer. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. So I will send everyone uh, a little bit of a follow up, a recap, um, and maybe link out some of the typefaces that you showed us today, some of the fonts, which is great. Of course. Um, and yeah. also the Font of the Month Club. So we'll contact everyone who is now a new member of the Font yes. of the Month Club. Yeah. Well, and, and can I just say before we go, thank you so much to everyone for coming to this. And Rachel, you're so awesome for organizing these. So thank you as well. Ah, oh, thanks, guys. Well, we'll see in a couple uh, weeks. We should have a couple more people. We have Janine Van Gool from Uppercase Magazine. We have Scott Bombs from Facebook. Uh, more people. I just don't want to like say everyone just in case. What's up? What happened? Uh, it's snowing outside. Oh, it's snowing. <laughs> uh, this here in this LA, winter it's is not, not, not ending. <laughs> well, have a good day, everyone. I appreciate your time, and we'll see you next time. Thank you again, David. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.